I am Tahir Gora in Candid Talk at TAG TV. Today I'll be having a Candid Talk with Imam Muhammad Tahiti. Imam Muhammad Tahiti was born in Iran of Iraqi origin based in Australia. He is also known as the Imam of Peace. Welcome Imam Tahiti. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Greetings to you and to your audience. Thank you. For us, you have been a voice of reason, rationality, and reformist ideas in Islam. How would you like to introduce yourself? In reality, I am a uh, very basic person that acquired Islamic uh, sciences from the Islamic seminaries of Qom and Karbala. And I try my best to bridge between the uh, communities in the West and the Muslim community. I do my best in breaking barriers and uh, the means that I uh, do all of this through and achieve all of this through is through diplomatic relations and uh, also being the, uh, the much needed voice to criticize terrorism and extremist ideologies that threaten our way of life. What is the future of progressive version of Islam? I must ask you in fact. In reality, in my opinion, the future of Islam depends on how we will deal with the current situation of Islam at the moment. The future depends on our efforts. It is impossible that Muslim communities sit and do very little and expect a lot in the future. Wahhabi Islam is growing. The Islamism of the Iranian regime spread by missionaries to the West. Also we have another issue of the Muslim Brotherhood buying politicians. These issues need to be tackled whether it be through diplomacy or ideologically. I believe the future of Islam depends on our efforts to isolate this minority and to give voice to the people that actually want a reformed uh, Islamic jurisprudence away from beheading, away from stoning, away from terrorism away from suicide bombing and anything that resembles the ideology of ISIS that the world has been witnessing since 2014. So you uh, mentioned Wahhabi Islam, Shia Islam and different other uh, versions of Islam and I would say that schools of thought. But when we say progressive Islam, in our Canadian context, we have different progressive Muslim groups. And in Australia, we view you as a very progressive Muslim. So progressive Islam could be another new version of Islam or is just derived from Islam by itself? In my personal opinion and based on the studies that I have uh, done and conducted uh, within the history of Islam, Islam in itself, just like every other religion, when it first emerges, it emerges as a progressive belief system. No religion emerges saying, hey, we are the symbol of backwardism. No religion does that. Every religion that emerges, emerges in the name of a progressive belief system, and that is why the millions follow it. In my opinion, the emergence of Islam in Mecca, there's a big difference between Islam in Mecca and Islam in Medina. Islam in Mecca, was a progressive belief system, in my belief. Therefore, the emergence of Islam as an Abrahamic faith in Mecca was a very progressive uh, belief system, in the sense that uh, it contained teachings that said, stop burying your newborn daughters. And also, it worked very hard on ending slavery. These are two examples from the tens of matters that took place in the Meccan version of Islam. And I'm being very specific because things changed when politics started uh, getting involved in religion when the prophets migrated to Medina. These two uh, examples, ending slavery and stopping the cultural barbaric act of burying newborn daughters alive because it was shameful for the Arabs, these matters show you that although the adherents of Islam were only a handful, only a handful, 
there weren't many people, less than 50 people. It shows you that even that small minority had a belief that was progressive for the barbaric, backward Meccan culture at the time. And when speaking about Mecca, one needs to understand that Mecca, uh, for the Arabian uh, region, the whole geographic region, Mecca in itself was uh, like the capital city for the Arabian economy. And it's also mentioned in the Quran. Uh, it was the hub of the uh, businessmen, the tradesmen, as what we know today, the uh, elite groups uh, of Arabia, they used to come and they used to trade carpets and art and clothing and, and everything from silk to uh, uh, regular dress codes. The main capital city for the economy was Mecca, before Islam even emerged. Now, looking at such a diverse city, it's very hard to accept that they were burying their daughters alive because they saw it was a shameful thing. Therefore, Islam came to add on to such a well, um, uh, let me call it well-developed area for the, uh, uh, the Meccans at the time and also the Arabs. The, one of the main terminologies Islam uses to refer to the Meccan time before the emergence of Islam is Jahiliyyah, the era of ignorance. Therefore, Naturally, if Islam refers to Mecca before Islam as the era of ignorance, clearly at that time Islam had a more progressive uh, view to life. But things did change down in Medina and after the death, death of the Prophet with all of the invasions and terrorism that we saw. So, uh, we secular Muslims uh, living in western part of the world claim that... Uh, Islam in its origin is a progressive religion. But on the other hand, uh, in 21st century, we see quite opposite to it, I mean, by the actions of our fellow Muslim beings. And I'm sure you are addressing this issue many times, you have addressed this issue. But how would you like to enlighten our viewers on this very sensitive issue? That on one hand, we claim our progressiveness, but on the other hand, we are quite opposite to it, to make it more clear. Islam being a religion from God, we claim that Islam is a religion from God. It's impossible as believers in God to believe that any religion coming from God is a violent religion against humanity and it's a belief system or an ideology that wants to go around and butcher people. The fact that we believe that Islam came from God clearly shows that Islam up until this very sentence of mine is a religion of peace. So any religion, Christianity, Judaism, any religion claiming to have a link with God has to be a religion of peace because God does not butcher his creations. Later on, when this religion of peace falls into the hands of human beings, whether or not it's really a religion of peace now or it continues to be a religion of peace is a whole different discussion. Religion coming from God to mankind, this very transition is a transition of peace. What humans choose to do with this belief system and ideology is a whole different story. We find the Umayyads changed succession into kingship from caliphs to kings. They use the same Quran. Shia Islam uses the same Quran. Sunni Islam uses the same Quran. Most of the Islamic faith depend only on the Quran regardless of the Hadith when living their lives. Many like the Akhbaris live based on Hadith more than the Qur'an. All of the 70 plus Islamic denominations believe in the Qur'an and they live by the Qur'an. Yet all of them are killing each other because of evidence from the Qur'an. This shows you that we are dealing with this level of intellect that a human being is trying to interpret the words of God and when not qualified we, we, we are faced with a very dangerous situation where now faiths and ideologies and schools of thoughts are being introduced to this whole, uh, this whole uh, 
let's call it the table of discussion when it comes to uh, theology and doctrine. And none of them are really qualified. You'll find one of them is blind or one of them came 300 years after the Prophet Muhammad. One of them doesn't speak Arabic. One of them uh, doesn't even believe in the Prophet as an infallible being that is worthy of worship. One of them believes the Prophet ur urinates in the street. How do these people become qualified to form faiths? Therefore, if we believe God is peace, then everything coming from God has to be peaceful. If we see that there's a religion that claims a link with God and is a violent religion, the problem is with the people. The problem is with the adherents of that faith. Yes, we do have terrorist teachings in our books. These terrorist teachings can be uh, ignored without any problem. So, for example, if I claim God is one, and I claim there is heaven and, and hell, and there is a hereafter, what other human beings want to believe when it comes to stoning and killing, these matters ca can be ignored and the main core principle of the faith and the religion will not shake. They will not be affected. So what I'm getting, uh, that Islam is one thing which is faith and political Islam is another thing. Exactly. Political Islam is the reason for killing each other. So when we denounce political Islam as Muslims, when we challenge political Islam and say that this is not acceptable uh, in our faith, that part, all Islamic organizations and Muslim leadership, they go against us and they say, oh, you are challenging Islam. And, but on the other hand, we are challenging political Islam. So how to deal that mindset? The problem with the Islamic institution the main governing bodies of Islamic schools of thought is that they have made a big mistake when understanding the religion of Islam and I say this with full audacity Islam as a religion like Christianity like Judaism all religions come with one mission and that is to guide the human being not to rule over the human being political Islam comes from the problem that some scholars in Islam, and they're the majority, believe that Islam can be used as a tool to govern human beings. And this is the problem. Islam is not a constitution that one can use in a government. And this is why all Islamic governments are failing governments with the worst economy, the highest uh, statistics in divorce, the, the people are upset, uh, prisons are full, people are fleeing the country, flooding the West. Why? Because all Islamic governments are a fail. I don't want to speak about other religions, other theocracies, but I speak about my religion. All governments that used Islam as a formula for their constitution, in other words, violent Sharia law, all of them fail. No one can now give me one good, successful Muslim government. All of them have problems that can be avoided. Basic problems, uh, for example, bread and so on, 100 times uh, the value goes up in a matter of one year. People are uprising, they're protesting. Why? Because Islam is not a constitution to govern. It's a constitution to guide. And even that can be uh, questioned because... You cannot impose your faith on anyone, whether you have a government or not. So, uh, let me be a uh, devil's advocate for my own faith. In today's complex world, people see Islam is an elephant in the room. And they see kind of uh, a hindrance uh, uh, in modernization within Muslims due to our faith because of the actions uh, people are carrying in the name of Islam or whatever reasons. How to modernize Islam or Muslims? Is it one thing, modernizing Islam or Muslim, or two different things? Please, help us to the, understand the phenomena. These two terminologies, two terminologies, modernizing Islam and political Islam, they are not one terminology, both of them each, they're not terminologies that apply in one way upon all Muslims. So for example, political Islam in Saudi Arabia it's different. In Iran it's different. Exported from Saudi Arabia, exported from Iran in different ways. 
political Islam, the concept that religion uses a form of politics or mixes with, it, with politics in order to impose its faith through political means is one matter. And it can also be linked with Islamism, although the definition of political Islam is much broader than this. But just to touch upon it. And modernizing Islam in a terminology is very different. Modernizing Islam in Saudi Arabia, as we see uh, in recent times, is one thing. Modernizing Islam in Oman and Dubai is another thing. You find both countries now, Saudi Arabia claims to be a modern society, imprisoning the radical clerics, closing down uh, fundamental institutions. But the UAE is also moderate. This is moderate, that is moderate. But when you compare UAE with Saudi Arabia, no matter how reformed Saudi Arabia is, there's still a problem. So mod Islam being a modern religion in itself cannot apply to all Muslims at once. Because obviously the means to this modernization differ. And if the means differ, the results will definitely differ. So as we are talking about uh, uh, political Islam, so we cannot uh, disassociate ourselves from world politics. Recently, uh, we have seen a president uh, in the United States, the most important country uh, for the rest of the world, uh, Mr. Donald Trump, who seems tough with Islamist ideology. Would that stance help to curb extremism within Muslim communities? Whatever happens in Washington, D.C. from the American administration influences the rest of the world. And this is why the rest of the world always has something to say when it comes to decisions made in Canada. Because it affects them directly. It affects their economy, it affects international security, and so on. President Donald Trump and his fight against Islamism should not be limited to America's benefits. So if you're going to wage a war against Islamism, wage a war on Islamism in all aspects. In all aspects. I can't speak for the foreign ministry of America because clearly they have had issues with Syria, with Iran, and so on. Therefore, there are efforts against Islamism and there are efforts against Islamic terrorism and there are efforts against uh, the uh, violent uh, Islamic regimes around the world. However, within America, within America, we also need to make sure that we tackle the Muslim Brotherhood, the Islamization of certain areas, the hundreds of mosques that are being built without any monitoring, the unvetted immigration system. So if we are going to tackle Islamism, it's not limited to Donald Trump. Donald Trump is not the savior. He's here for a few years and he will leave and then another one will come after him. They could undo everything this current president has done. Our war against radical Islam isn't limited nor dependent upon the president of the United States, whoever he may be. The main issue is that whoever comes and sits on the chair in Washington, D.C. needs to understand that the war against Islamism isn't a war of four years or eight years. It is a war of ideology. Therefore, the sanctions that need to be placed upon these Islamic regimes that are sending their missionaries around the world, spreading radical Islam, the sanctions need to be realistic. And they can't be, you give me money, I will let you do whatever you want to do. I support a strong America. I support, a strong, I support strong American borders. But at the same time, I believe that if we have a cancer within the country, this cancer need to be, needs to be eradicated as well. Therefore, the Islamization of certain Islamic centers within America also needs to be dealt with. So yes, I support uh, the current efforts of the, uh, the current American administration. Uh, however, I feel that the beginning was uh, very uh, serious. Now things have cooled down a bit. So I'd like to see them take even further action against American citizens who are radical Muslims. So you have always been surrounded by controversies due to your progressive and secular ideas in Islam. How do you encounter those controversies? First of all, 
the controversies heading in my direction are something very expected. I mean, you cannot uh, uh, speak about a, a belief system without people who believe in this belief system being somewhat offended or frustrated or so on. I don't endorse violence and I don't con condone violence and I uh, respect the opinions of everybody. I keep my discussions ideological, academic. If there's an imam who believes that uh, he is willing to be the hero for his community to prove me wrong, I'm here, they can come, reach out to your channel. We can organize a debate. And if there's an imam that can prove me uh, wrong, I'll resign happily. I've made them the best offer. Up until now, I have uh, given many offers to many imam councils. If there's an imam that wants to prove me wrong, ahlan wa sahlan, I'll be more than happy uh, for, for any uh, respectful uh, discussion with them. And uh, with regards to my credentials, they claim that I was uh, not an imam. My credentials are available on my website. And in fact, it took an investigation by a royal uh, organization to confirm uh, my position within the Muslim community. Uh, I'm not in need of uh, uh, verification from any other person. I am myself. And if there's someone that wants to uh, test my knowledge in Islam, then let them come forward. I, I welcome with, with a very warm heart. When I say controversies, I didn't mean about uh, your uh, credentials because to me, uh, to any, uh, I would say, educated person, uh, those so-called degrees do not matter a lot. What matters, your talk, your approach towards issues, and uh, your knowledge, your actual knowledge. So in that context, why in our culture, as particularly in Muslim culture, uh, there is not a room for a dialogue. We actually bash uh, each other and uh, we reject each other. So that kind of uh, environment of uh, tolerance and accommodating each other's idea is a possible dream in our culture? And how, uh, if, it's not, uh, if it does not exist? Firstly, I knew this is what you meant in the previous question. I tried to, uh, to give you a different answer. But now that you're insisting, I will let you know that uh, the concept of criticism isn't, uh, doesn't exist in Islam. And it's not accepted in Islam by any Islamic scholar or any Islamic community. And this is a problem. This is a disease within the Muslim community that you cannot criticize a book. You can't criticize a cleric. Uh, and uh, the moment you do, that's the only time you're allowed to criticize, and it is the person who speaks the truth. Uh, there are many uh, problems within the, the whole Islamic body, and I've said this many times. Uh, we do need a review of our religion, of our clerical systems, of the books that are being published, who publishes them, who teaches them, and so on. I, uh, I'm a big believer in free speech and in criticism. And I welcome criticism to myself as well. However, these two concepts, free speech and criticism, don't exist in the Muslim mindset at all. At all. And whoever tells you that I'm a Muslim, I believe in free speech, yes, they learned free speech from America or from the West, uh, from some Western country. It's impossible for a Muslim to sit in Saudi Arabia or Iran and say, yes, free speech is welcome in my community. It doesn't exist. Is there any chance in the near future in our Muslim world that uh, we uh, actually make ourselves to understand in terms of separating religion and politics from each other? Religion and politics, when it comes to Islam in itself, there was never a link between religion and politics. Give me one Islamic government now, for example, the Iranian regime claims to be the Islamic government of Iran, correct? This whole Islamic government of Iran is founded based upon a, a theory of Khomeini. The theory of the government of the jurist. So in other words, a theory is his opinion. There, were, there was no foundation for the government of the jurist in the Quran or in the Hadith. It's his opinion. So the link between Islam and politics, mosque and state in Iran, for example, is based on a theory. So in reality... There is no link between Islam and politics. This is all man-made things. 
and uh, you it's impossible politics is basically governing in order to benefit personal interests religion is to guide people mixing the guidance of people with personal benefits of politicians isn't a holy combination it's an unhealthy combination it's a big problem and in my opinion that all governments that are based on uh, theocracies are not, not successful and they're full of problems for this very reason. So the separation of mosque and state in Islam is basically clarifying to people that these governments are a fraud. That's all what we have to say. They're a fraud. There is no basis for them in Islam to begin with. So why do we have an Islamic government making all Islamic governments illegitimate? All of them. It's a pleasure having you, Imam Muhammad Tawhidi. And uh, we are very grateful that you have granted us some time Thank you. in your very busy schedule. Thank you. And uh, hope to have you again and again. My pleasure. And uh, in the end, I would like to ask you to say something which uh, you think we really missed in our conversation. I truly believe that the upcoming generations are in need of a platform that allows them to voice their opinions. Unfortunately, in the West, not, not many media channels are willing to give these people who escaped from Saudi Arabia, who escaped from Iran, give them a platform in order that they voice their opinions and tell their stories. A channel like yours, I see it as heroic, uh, that is willing to open these debates. And a channel that opens these debates is a channel that respects its viewers. So I congratulate you on this amazing and historical achievement. Uh, yes, my opinion is we should give uh, a platform for people who have valuable stories to come and share their experiences with us because it is by understanding these experiences that we can find solutions to these problems. Thank you, Imam Tahidi, once again for your time, for your kind words and for your understanding. Thank you very much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. God bless Thank you. Thank you. Viewers, you are watching Candid Talk with Imam Muhammad Tahidi. Thank you for watching TAC TV.